This week on Cosmic Sponge, conspiracy theorists worry that experiments involving the Large Hydron Collider could open a portal to a demon dimension. A mass grave of frogs is unearthed, and the cause of their demise leads researchers to a surprising X-rated amphibian backstory. For our main topic, we explore the disappearance of Flight MH370, including new information which just might lead to some long-awaited answers. We also take a little time to work on our dad jokes before things get too serious. There was a mass grave that scientists uncovered. These are ancient frogs. In fact, these fossils were 45 million years old. And for decades, scientists have been trying to figure out what they died from. You mean they were trying to figure out how they croaked? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Cosmic Sponge, the podcast where we discuss weird wonders in the world. I'm Stephen Hawk. And I'm Jimmy Coe. Tonight, we are going to do another installment of our segment, Mysterious Disappearances. Mm. And I'm not going to include the other part that Jimmy likes to say. We're just going to call it Mysterious Disappearances, okay? But let me tell you, this one did make me poop myself. <laughs> okay. We are looking into the mysterious disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 that disappeared over the Indian Ocean eight years ago. It's been in huge mystery. This plane seemingly disappeared into thin air. No searches have ever turned up this large Boeing 777 aircraft to this day. Before we get into that, Jimmy, what you been up to since our last episode? Well, I've been... Uh keeping my finger on the pulse of the internet the internet has a pulse it has a pulse and it's erratic and i was uh i was listening and i was looking for something really cool to share with our listeners tonight and i think i found it i found a group i like to refer to as the lowest common denominator and <laughs> it's it's a group who have this crazy conspiracy that the cern large hydron collider CERN. I didn't know yep. what CERN wa- uh, stood for. Do you know what that stands for? CERN? Yeah. Um, I've, I've read it, but I don't remember. Exactly. I, I looked it up. It's, it's, it's based on French because, I mean, it's a large group of nations that have come together. But, of course, the French are the ones who get to name it because I imagine they, they probably fund a large portion of it. Well, let's see. It's partially on Swiss soil and French soil, correct? Yes. Because it's yeah, it, huge. It actually goes over the border of both countries. Yeah, it's, it's large. That's why they call it Large Hydron Collider, I imagine. Right. <laughs> Conseil Europa pour la Rucha Cha Nuclear, which stands for either somebody stole my Butterfinger or... Big Ass Collider. Or Big Ass... European Council for Nuclear Research. Well, the fear from this lowest common denominator group is that it's going to open a portal to a demon dimension. Okay. Where where we get attacked to the chorus of uh, last year's losers from the show North Korea Got Talent. Coming from probably a karaoke bar singing the nation's latest hit. <laughs> Something like, I'm hungry. <laughs> Does anybody have a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the big fear coming out of this uh, group. And they're really worried about it to the point that they are having mock protest online. I wouldn't even call them real protests because I, I don't know how you do an online protest. Well, a mock protest would be a fake protest, right? Yeah, I, I got to believe it's a fake protest because it's probably just one guy in his basement trying to find something to do on a Saturday night. You can't tell how many people were at this protest. Anyway, hmm. they're worried that, you know, they'll get a couple particles going up close to the speed of light. They'll collide and bam, portal open. And I don't know really how that works. They really don't explain how it works. I have to say, after reading this article, I never thought about it before, but now I'm a little worried as well. I mean, <laughs> well, you know, that gigantic super collider is this massive experiment. Mm-hmm. I've heard other people be concerned that somehow they're going to open up a black hole and it'll swallow up the earth. You know, here's the dimension going to let demons out or, you know, any, any number of B movie science fiction plots you can think of experimenting. Yeah, that's why uh, we should teach physics in, in school. Right. 
everybody should take a little physics. Yeah. But then again, we wouldn't have these great screenplays of all these B-horror films if we Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I saw uh, an article published September 12th, 2022 on the Big Think website. The headline is, Ancient Frogs in Mass Grave Died from Too Much Sex. Say what? Died from too much sex. There was a mass grave that scientists uncovered. These are ancient frogs. In fact, these fossils were 45 million years old. Well, how can they decide? Were they dehydrated? Hundreds of frog fossils were found in a mass grave of 45 million year, year old swampy coastlines in Gisitals. These fossils have been around for a little while, and for decades, scientists have been trying to figure out what they died from. You mean they were trying to figure out how they croaked? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a few theories out there. Like one was, just as you had said, maybe they were all in a pond. It dried up. That's, that's possible. Some kind of environmental disturbance, something like that, could have caused all these uh, frogs to, to die quickly. Or they said that oxygen levels could have decreased rapidly in the pond, which would have caused the, the frogs to uh, to die. But then they did a little more research. They realized that these geestal frogs were actually toads. Frogs live in the water all the time, and toads generally have a land-based lifestyle, right? And the only time they return to the water is to mate and to have their little tadpoles and everything, right? Mm -hmm. The article says sex can be a death trap for modern toad and frog species. Individuals are regularly overcome by exhaustion and drown. Female frogs and toads are at higher risk of drowning as they are often submerged underwater by one or more males. Even today, mass toad graves are found on migration routes and near or in mating ponds. This was likely to be the same situation for these specimens. Uh, baby, let's uh, let's head back to shore where I keep my stereo. Let's let's not go into the deep water tonight. But bow chicky wow wow. <laughs> Stay close to land. <laughs> Put this life vest on before we get to the do the nasty. <laughs> This fossil collection's in Germany. They said it was closed for decades, but recently reopened to the public. It has over 50,000 fossils from a former coal mine in Giestel. Okay, where is where is this Giestel? Germany, you said? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Fossils include crocodiles, huge snakes, flightless giant birds, and dog-sized primeval horses. And a gazillion frogs with big smiles on their faces. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, all right. Um, let's move on to tonight's main topic. But before we do, I'd like to remind everyone to please rate and review the podcast. It helps other people find the show. Look for us on Instagram, where Jimmy uh, displays his warped sense of humor. It's not warped. It's a pretty straight-laced kind of humor. <laughs> Did you see the one today? Woo. Oh, no, I haven't. I had to get caught up on them. The one today actually elicited a response from one of our listeners who, who sent me a joke uh, about the today's Instagram, and uh, or at least based on today's Instagram. Yeah. And it's an old joke. I'd, I'd heard it before. And he says, well, what does the Enterprise and toilet paper have in common? They search for Klingons. They, yeah, they orbit Uranus and search for Klingons. Oh. Yeah. It's like the joke has evolved over time. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I heard that joke when I was in high school, so that is a very old joke. Yeah, I think I heard that joke uh, when I was in college, given our age yeah. difference. That sounds right. Also, look for us on Facebook. You can find many of the stories that we cover on, on the show, plus lots more of fringe science, weird science, UFOs, Bigfoot, cryptids, sea monsters, you name it. If we find a cool story, we'll put it up there. Over-sexualized frogs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> While you're at it, visit our webpage, CosmicSpunch.com. There you can find the web store where we sell T-shirts, coffee mugs, and all kinds of other things with the Cosmic Sponge logo. And there's also ways to support the show. One is buy me a coffee for a one-time donation, or you can support us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Cosmic Sponge and gain access to our weird wonder show that we produce exclusively for our Patreon supporters. Our contact information is firstcontact at cosmicsponge.com. All right. Well, let's move on to tonight's show. And, Jimmy, I know you've 
<laughs> I know you've done a little research on this thing tonight, so why don't you get us kicked off on this mysterious disappearance? The missing chromosomes were evident from the lackluster photo Tide selected for his Twitter profile. <laughs> the slacked jaw and vacant expression coupled with the, uh, what's up, protruding tongue, was enough to question the NATO phonetically encoded message he claimed was from the doomed MH370 flight out of Malaysia. Deciphered, the message reads, Danger, SOS. It is dire for you to evacuate. Be caution. They are not human. 0429339642300. SOS. Danger. SOS. In no time at all, an alien invasion hypothesis, including the full abduction of the plane's passengers, blew through the gutters of the internet, garnering Ty a boost in his followers, corresponding, unsurprisingly, to the drop in Pew Research statistics estimating the measurable IQ of Twitter users. Many bizarre conspiracies, and some not so bizarre, would grow out of this mystery surrounding the loss of flight MH370. It's been over eight years now, and new information has come to light, which may lead to the plane's final resting place, the recovery of the flight recorder, and hopefully some answers for our families and loved ones impacted by this event. Tonight, we're going to explore the timeline of this loss, and then we're going to cover some of the conspiracies involved, and perhaps what might be the actual event and why it happened and what's going on. I should have written that last piece down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we want to get started with this. And, it, and it's kind of strange. I mean, the circumstances of this disappearance, it just, it's kind of bizarre of how it went so long without being discovered. But anyway, let's get into it. The disappearance of Malaysia Airlines passenger jet on March 8, 2014, en route to Beijing from Kuala Lumpur. I believe that was, what, about a six-hour flight? That sounds about right. Five to six-hour flight. So it had a lot of fuel on it. It was a Boeing 777. It had 227 passengers and 12 crew members on board, including the pilot and co-pilot. The Boeing 777 had an excellent safety record. It was the 40th aircraft to come off the assembly line and had had no issues. Also, the maintenance on the aircraft, you know, to check it out, they have to do regular maintenance on these things, had been conducted on February 23rd, so just a couple of weeks before this disappearance occurred. The likelihood of this being some type of catastrophic failure of the aircraft itself is pretty unlikely. There were a few reports that there were some safety bulletins about specific Boeing 777s had come out from the FAA, but it didn't affect this specific model. It had to do with the positioning of an antenna on the fuselage. Some of the planes on the assembly line, the antenna wasn't positioned correctly and it could cause stress fractures in the top of the fuselage. This model was not affected by that, so there's no reason to believe that there was any kind of mechanical failures. Prior to taking off, we've got our captain, Zahari Ahmed Shia, uh, first officer, Farik Abdul Hamed. The aircraft's SDU logs into the Emerstat Satellite Communication Network, and this is a way that it can um, establish... Uh, locations with the satellites communication network the ATC gives the flight clearance to push back from the gate and then to take off so it departs the runway at 12:41 a.m. everything seems fine and the aircraft disappears from radar 40 minutes into its flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing with 227 passengers and 12 crew on board on this flight path going to Beijing the aircraft takes off from Malaysia, and initially you have the airport control, which guides them to which runway, altitude they need to go, if they need to turn right, left, whatever, when they come off there, out of the airport. Once the airplane is airborne and it's leaving the vicinity of the airport, the air traffic controllers hand it off to the Malaysian air traffic control, which really controls the entire airspace. They were cleared to fly to 35,000 feet, which they did. 
about 40 minutes into the flight of what should have been the six-hour flight to Beijing, as they're transitioning from Malaysian airspace to Vietnamese airspace, the captain communicates with air traffic control, Malaysian air traffic control, and essentially says, we're transitioning, good night, something like that, very casual, no problem there. And then at that point, he should have switched frequencies to the Ho Chi Minh air traffic control in Vietnam and, you know, said, hello, we're coming into your airspace, and they would have had a little communication. Ho Chi Minh, of course, was expecting them to do this because they would have had a copy of their flight plan. But that communication never arrives. So as soon as they are leaving Malaysian airspace, they disappear from radar. No further communication was ever made with that aircraft. Yeah, I think they believe that right after that last all right, good night message to Kuala Lumpur. They believe that the ACAR system had been manually shut down. And the ACAR system is the Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. It's a digital data link system that's used for transmissions of short messages between aircraft and ground stations um, via air band radio or satellite. This takes us to 1.22 in the morning. Also, disappearing from radar, what's known as secondary radar of air traffic control, means that the transponder was switched off or stopped functioning. So we had two communication systems at the same time cease to function. The ACAR system, which is the digital communication system, and also the transponder, which transmits to air traffic control and says, hi, I'm flight 370, this is my flight plan, has all this information about what that aircraft is so that air traffic control can track it. From 122, when they believe that the ACAR system was shut down, this is the time where they were supposed to contact uh, Ho Chi Minh ACC and establish a rapport with them, uh, let them know that they were flying over their airspace, and uh, that would allow them to keep in touch with the ground as they transverse that section, that leg of the uh, journey. It's about at 1.39 when Ho Chi Minh contacts Kuala Lumpur to inquire about Flight 370, saying that a verbal contact hadn't been established with the flight, and it had disappeared from the radar screens near Waypoint BITOD. Now, this took about 20 minutes. Yeah. Very short. It should have took about five minutes when they didn't make their scheduled call. So there's a bit of controversy there uh, that it took so long for them to reach out and try to contact the aircraft and also reach out to Kuala Lumpur. I don't know the exact time, but I do know that the airline itself had a way to track the aircraft. And they had noticed that the aircraft had gone off course, I believe around 2.30 in the morning or something. And they, the airline themselves, tried to reach out to the aircraft to find out what was going on. And they used a, they have a sap phone. The calls went unanswered. Yes. And there were some confusing communications between Malaysian Airlines. I think Malaysian Airlines was trying to keep a lid on the situation and figure out where their pilot was, where their aircraft was. And, of course, you know, air, air traffic control trying to figure out what happened to this aircraft. Yeah, and they're not relying just on ground-based uh, sources to contact the plane. They're also trying to get aircraft-to-aircraft -aircraft communications with other planes that are in the area with no luck. So it's about at 2.03 in the morning when Flight 370 is identified to be in Cambodian airspace. Now that comes from the civilian radar of Ho Chi Minh air traffic control. Correct. And then at 222, the last primary radar contact is made by the Malaysian military at 200 nautical miles northwest of Penang. And several hours pass. It's still like another, finally when it's established uh, around 3.30 or something in the morning, that they're over Cambodian or had been over Cambodian airspace. They finally dispatch search and rescue but it still takes two or three hours. There was no mayday signal. There was no distress from the airplane, but it had dropped off radar. And unfortunately, they chose to search where the plane had come off radar in the South China Sea. And of course, they searched there to begin with and uh, found nothing. Now, later they would determine that there were handshakes going on between the 
Inmerstat satellite communication network and the plane. Uh, that's something that's built into the Boeing aircraft. It's uh, automated, so it's something that wasn't turned on or off by anybody who was operating the, the plane itself. And they would continue to get some automated handshakes all the way up until, I guess that's what... Um, it was 8.19 in the morning was the last handshake yep. that they received. Uh, yeah, it, about once an hour, mm-hmm. it would ping back and forth between this uh, comstat. I'm not even sure the pilot would have been aware that that system was even on there. It may have been a system that Boeing was using. But the problem with that data was it took a while to disseminate where that data came from. And the people with the, with the comsat, didn't it take something like a week? for them to, to actually uh, share this information with the search and rescue teams? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that was established later. But as the search uh, began in the South China Sea, the governments acted a, a little strange. The military acted a, a kind of odd. Uh, I've seen several military people interviewed, and they said the proper procedure, when the aircraft had actually turned south and was flying over the Malaysian Peninsula, because it had no transponder, and of course, military radar is going to be looking for aircraft that is not going to have a transponder if they're under attack or something like that, right? So their radar systems, their primary radar systems are just looking for radar returns. Well, they, they get a radar return as the airplane had turned south and was flying back over the Malaysian Peninsula. What should have happened... I think the Minister of Defense or something said that the proper procedure would have been to scramble a couple of fighter jets to go up and intercept this aircraft to find out what was going on. But then the people at the base said, well, we knew it was a civilian airliner, so we, we didn't bother with it. You know, there was something that maybe maybe could have changed the outcome. But And then some of the other countries are in the area. Uh, didn't want to share their radar data. I don't think they wanted to uh, in, in the following subsequent days. I think Indonesia and some of the other countries around there had been tracking the play, but they, they didn't want to share that data. They didn't want to share their capabilities, right? Even Malaysia didn't want to share all their full capabilities of their radar systems with potential enemies, you know, right across uh, in the area, I guess. Yeah, and so there's so much going on here. Just to take a step back, we're looking at March 8th is when the plane takes off. March 9th is when, uh, you know, our first full day of uh, search and rescue occurs. And they expanded out to the Straits of Malacca after it was confirmed that the plane had diverged back from its original heading. So it's on March 15th, seven days after takeoff, that they... um, in Marstat, satellite had confirmed that it, it flew an additional seven hours after losing contact. If you know what the Malaysian Peninsula looks like. So the aircraft was traveling to the northeast toward Beijing. They began the search to the north of Malaysia where the last civilian radar contact was made. When it was determined by the from the military radar that the aircraft had turned to the southwest, they concentrated the search in the Strait of Malacca, which was just on the other side of the Malaysian Peninsula. And that was the location of the last military radar contact. But the last known satellite ping was very far out into the Indian Ocean. But that information wasn't shared because they were, it took, for for whatever reason, the SATCOM information took a while to, to disseminate. I, I don't know, Jimmy, you might know more about why that took so long, but it did take about a week to finally confirm that the last known satellite position was something like 2,000 miles, probably 2,400 miles west of their current search. Yeah, this wasn't something that the people involved immediately thought of. It was actually the people at Boeing who uh, was like, oh, there, the, we do have this satellite system that receives this handshake data. Let's see if we can go collect that and get any additional detail once they discovered that the plane did indeed track longer than the suspected, seven hours longer than the suspected time that they originally thought it had flown before it went down. So that puts it way into the Indian Ocean off to the east. And the problem with it is those satellite pings just ping it about once an hour. 
and you still don't know within that hour. I mean, they calculate how much fuel the aircraft would have had before it ran out of, and uh, determine how long it could have flown. But even then, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of square miles that it could have, the aircraft could have went down in the ocean. And, and you can't really fault the search and rescue so much because, you know, they began their search. I mean, at first, they're thinking it's just a plane crash, that there was some kind of catastrophic failure on the aircraft. So they searched at the last civilian contact. But then whenever they realized, wait a minute, the aircraft went south, they searched at the area of the last military radar contact. It wasn't until a week later it was determined the aircraft had flown very far out to sea in the Indian Ocean. Yeah, so we go all the way out to April 1st, and the Australian government gets involved and launches a joint agency-coordinated center to carry out the search opera- a search operation for MH370. Uh, the transport ministry out of Kuala Lumpur issues a full transcript of the conversations between the pilots and air traffic controllers, and no abnormality was found at that time. On April 4th, the Joint Agency Coordination Center that the Australians had set up uh, said that the search was entering a new phase with search done on the seafloor in the southern Indian Ocean to detect a signal from the MH370 black box with no success. We fast forward almost a month later to April 28th, and the air search ended after failing to see a single piece of debris in the 4.6 million square kilometers of the ocean. August 28th, near the end of the summer, this was months afterwards. Remember, it disappeared in March. And of course, during all this time, the families are wanting answers. Friends and family are asking Malaysian Airlines what happened, and they just can't understand why they're not getting any answers. I mean, the country wants to know. The world wants to know. This was a huge story. I'm sure, listeners, you remember when this happened. Yeah. Fast forward to August 28th, the Transport Minister Datuk Sero uh, Liao Tayong Lai. Um, the man with too many names, announced that Australia (laughs) and Malaysia bared the estimated new phase of phases estimated at RM 153.28 mil. I guess that's the cost, maybe, in some obscure currency. October the 21st of 2014, so we're into the fall now, Malaysia contracted a ship Go Phoenix to join the search operation with Fugro Discovery and Fugro uh, Equator, two other uh, ships. I guess that would go on for some time, bringing us into uh, 2015. After this aircraft disappeared, a lot of people are asking why. I mean, this obviously was not your average plane crash. This plane appeared to be deliberately piloted away from its intended destination. It was determined, looking at the radar data, of when the aircraft made the turn and the timing. The transponders turned off. The ACE car systems turned off. There's no way to communicate with the aircraft. By turning the transponder off, it drops you out of air traffic control observation. And then The aircraft makes a very sharp turn south very quickly. And and this is within minutes of them communicating with Malaysian air traffic control, saying everything's fine, good night, we'll see you next time, getting ready to switch over to Vietnamese. And then it's like switch, switch, turn south. Now, pilots can use their autopilot. They can program in a heading change, right? Like if they're going to go south they program in the points of the compass how many degrees it is and so it may be 35 degrees or it may be 125 degrees they can program that into the autopilot and the autopilot makes the turn they don't even have to touch the stick right or the the yoke but they said this turn would not have been made by the autopilot that the turn was too sharp and it had to be manually controlled So somebody turned off the autopilot after they disconnected all communication. Someone turned that aircraft very sharply south and started heading southwest. The question is, who? Right. And immediately, all the speculation goes to the pilot, Sahari. I heard it said maybe not immediately. I I heard a lot of people say that he was a career pilot, had decades experience. Oh, this this is something. This is uh, yeah. I'm gonna let me find that. He had, I mean, an enormous number of hours. He had over eighteen thousand hours. That is huge. I mean, usually 
a good, you know, 10,000 hours in the air is somebody very, very experienced. I've seen interviews with uh, some of the people that knew him, other pilots, that he was very methodical, a very good pilot, didn't make mistakes. And the co-pilot w- wasn't as experienced, but he had about 2,700 hours. Yeah, 53-year-old Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah. He joined Malaysian Airlines as a cadet in 1981. After training and receiving his commercial pilot's license, he became a second officer with the airline in 1983, was promoted to captain of Boeing 737 airliners in 1991, captain of Airbus A330-300 in 96, and a captain of the Boeing 777-200 in 1998. He had been a type rating instructor and a type rating examiner since 2007. Sahari had a total of 18,365 hours of flying experience. The co-pilot was 27-year-old first officer, Farik Abdul Hamid. He joined Malaysia Airlines as a cadet in 2007 after becoming a second officer of Boeing 737, promoted to first officer of the Boeing 737 in 2010, and transitioned to the Airbus A330 in 2012. In November 2013, he began training as first officer of the Boeing 777. In fact, flight 370 was his final training flight, and he was scheduled to be examined on his next flight. Farik had accumulated 2,763 hours of flying experience. Oh, that sucks. Of the passengers, of the 227 passengers, 153 were Chinese citizens. There was a group of 19 artists with six family members and four staff returning from a calligraphy exhibition of their work in Kuala Lumpur. 38 passengers were Malaysian. The remaining passengers were from 12 different countries. 20 passengers, 12 of whom were from Malaysia and eight from China, were employees of Freescale Semiconductor, which plays into some conspiracy theories we'll discuss later. Ooh. Can't wait. There were two passengers on this aircraft that immediately brought suspicion that this could have been a hijacking. Do you know about that, Jimmy? I don't. Really? I don't. There were two Iranians on the aircraft traveling with false false passports. Oh, yes. I remember this. Yeah. Akbar Crash Smith and Sammy the Hijacker Jones. Yeah, I I remember those guys. (laughs) I mean, those names alone should have given them some pause when they were checking them in. Right. Uh, Yeah. And and then also, just to add even more mystery to this story, whenever their photographs were released to the public, some people started noticing that the, the pictures from the waist down were of the same person. You know, they showed two pictures of these uh, Iranian people or uh, men that jo- that boarded the aircraft under with false identity. And then when they showed the picture, people started noticing that the body, like the stance of the, the exactly the same legs, exactly the same shoes, the same color shoes. And then it's when you look at it very carefully, it's like, wait a minute. It's like one of the bodies is Photoshopped on the same set of legs. And then when this is pointed out in the press, the... Officials say, well, we we left the first, when we photocopied it, we left the first picture in there or something like that. Gave some kind of sort of lame excuse. They were like, yeah, we're aware of it, but it was just a, a mistake when we copied the picture. So that automatically breeds a whole lot of suspicion there. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just weird, right? I mean... It's weird, and they did track this down. Uh, the passports belong to two kids, um, P- Parora Noor Muhammad, 19, and Saeed Muhammad Rezar Delwar, 29. They were friends, and they were attempting to make their way to Germany on some fake Italian passports in an attempt to reunite with Noor Muhammad's mother, who was waiting for him there in Frankfurt. Yeah, they... You know, it's unfortunate, but these are just two two young men trying to uh, to get to Europe to make a better life for themselves. It's pretty well established that th- that they were asylum seekers. They were trying to get out of Iran and start a new life somewhere else. But still, it's strange. You know, you end up with the 
the whole conspiracy, or I mean, just you end up with a lot of suspicion about this because it was two Iranians, a country known to be kind of anti-West, funds terrorism and things like that. And then here's two undocumented or traveling under false passports on the plane that disappears. But a lot of focus was really brought on to the pilot Zahari, because when you look at this situation, I mean, somebody had to know exactly when that plane was going to be doing the handoff from Malaysian airspace to Vietnamese airspace and know that would be a really good spot to turn the transponder off and to turn the ASCAP, to have the expertise to turn those two systems off, which really could only be accessed from the cockpit. Now, there was some speculation that somebody in another part of the of the airplane could have gained access to a breaker panel underneath the baggage compartment or something like that, that they could have gained access or control to, of the aircraft from there. But that has pretty much been ruled out. It's like, no, that's not possible. Somebody had to have that expertise to turn these systems off, know when that handoff of air traffic control is going from one to the other, that this would be the place to make your move to drop off the face of the earth, so to speak. Yeah, so I was looking at this guy, right, this uh, this Captain Zawari. The first thing I read was, I find it hard to believe that Captain Zawari was the one who did this because he was a happy fellow, and he, was a, he had been a pilot for many years, and he had hobbies. And then they looked into his hobbies, and his hobbies were running flight simulators out into the middle of the Indian Ocean until the plane goes out of... Uh, fuel and now i don't know that that that's speculation that he flew the airplane out in on a simulator that's not speculation they actually have the two laptops and uh the flight simulator they got from his apartment well i would like to say there's a lot of pilots though that have flight simulators in their homes that build flight simulators very similar to what he built yeah that i mean that takes several computers take planes out into remote locations over open bodies of water until the fuel runs out? I don't know. <laughs> Seems a little suspicious. But his system was down. I thought it had crashed. It wasn't even working for months before all this happened. That's what witnesses say that were close to him. Oh, really? Yeah. At first, his family didn't want to speak. And in fact, his wife still didn't. But then his brother-in-law, the brother of Z- Zahari's wife, uh, was interviewed. I saw the interview. There was speculation that Zahari had a mistress or a girlfriend, and and somehow this thing was to make him disappear so that he could somehow be reunited with his girlfriend. The brother-in-law's like, well, that's okay. It's allowed. We can have girlfriends if we want, as long as you take care of your wife. (laughs) It's like, okay. And I mean, he seemed to not think, he said, I don't know if he had a girlfriend or not. I don't think so. But if he did, so what? As long as you take care of your wife, it's okay. And, And there was some... Controversy surrounding the wife because she had moved out of the house, or so it was said. And then then there was speculation that there were marital problems. Her brother said that that was something she always did when when her husband was going to be flying for a long time. She would leave the house, and they had one small child, I think, and usually come over and stay with him or stay with another family member just so they wouldn't be in this big house all by themselves while he's flying for, you know, a week or two. While her husband's out flying, she didn't want to be in the house all by herself. And they said that she'd done it all the time and that she hadn't just up and left, right? So that was a false, according to him. And then there was some speculation that he was a political activist and someone that he fully supported had been arrested and thrown in jail on sort of a trumped-up charge, like a political arrest? Well, it was a sodomy charge for a political opposition party member, which some say that he may have been a distant relative to, but definitely in support of Anwar and this uh, political leader, and was said to be a vocal political activist, Zawari, that is, of of this political figure. Uh, On March 7th, there was a court hearing where he was sentenced And they think this may have triggered Zahari to some extent. So, I mean, it's hard to say. What we do know for sure is that the aircraft used waypoints that only a uh, seasoned navigator would use. They shut off the transponder. So whoever was in 
control of that flight through the rest of its flight was more than likely either the captain or the co-pilot. It's likely that it was the pilot because he's the last one to make the communication. Right. And, and it would have been a relatively simple exercise to get the co-pilot out of the cockpit. Um, I mean, modern airliners now only have a pilot and a co-pilot. They don't have flight engineers anymore. The and new, new aircrafts are so highly automated now that just two men can handle all of the operations. And sadly, there have been other plane crashes that are known to have been suicides. So this is not a isolated incident. I watched an air disaster show a couple of weeks ago where the investigators went through the whole thing. The plane had crashed. It nosed straight in. They put the whole thing together that, you know, it had been so simple to get the co-pilot out of the cockpit. Just say, hey, there's a problem in the in the galley. Go check it out. You know, just get them out. And now all the cockpits have locks on them, right? And pretty secure locks yeah. because of the 9-11 attacks. And then the, in that case... They, they said absolutely the pilot had to. They said the aircraft, even if it was pointed nose down, would not have went in at that angle. You know, they said this pilot, in that case, had to be holding the controls and controlling that aircraft to, to crash the way it did at that, out, you know, at that particular attitude. That uh, an airplane left yeah. alone would not crash that way, in other words. Yeah, I, I fly a lot, so uh, this is making me a little nervous. <laughs> yeah. So there's the Sahara. His family seemed to think he had nothing to be suicidal about. So who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll maybe come back to him. So in late June of 2014, three months after the disappearance, they changed to an, a new phase. Officials called this new phase the underwater search. They had already tried a seafloor sonar survey and couldn't find it anything. But they continued a refinement of the analysis of Flight 370 satellite communication, and they developed this seventh arc, which gave them a, a narrowed down uh, search area. But it was still many miles long. And some of the equipment used in the underwater search is known to be the most effective when towed about 650 feet above the seafloor. The governments of Malaysia, China, and Australia made a joint commitment and thoroughly searched 120,000 square kilometers, or 46,000 square miles, of the seafloor. This phase of the search, which began on the 6th of October in 2014, used three vessels equipped with towed deep water vehicles that use side scan radar and multi beam echo sounders and video cameras to locate and identify aircraft debris. A fourth vessel participated in the search between January and May of 2015 using an AUV to search areas that could not be effectively searched using equipment of the other vessels. And then finally, a piece of debris was found. On the island of Reunion. Yeah. In the western Indian Ocean. Yeah, a flapperon was discovered. What's a flapperon? Um, it's like you have the flaps... Uh, when you uh, it create it generates a lot of lift. The flaps when they when they're taking off or coming in for a landing, it it can slow the aircraft, but it also creates a great deal of lift. There are these huge flaps that come down. It's on the and a flaperon's back side of the wing, back side of the actual large wing, right. not like the the elevator or the rudder in the back. Right. This is on the, the wing that creates lift, mm -hmm. and you've probably seen it yep. if you fly a lot. Yep. And they, they put those flaps down when they put the gear down and put the flaps down. That way they can go relatively slow and it creates a lot of, of lift, right? Right. Um, but when you start going faster, it creates a ton of drag, right? So it's it's designed for landing and takeoff, essentially. That's it. Mm -hmm. A flapper on is like a little control above it that's uh, a, a little flap on, on the flap. Uh, they can kind of fine tune it in a way. Right. It, it comes in th like two or three sections on the back side of the wing. Right. Um, that are layered. Depends on the aircraft. Yeah, right. Yeah. Those larger ones, like the this Boeing mm -hmm. craft has the, that larger piece. And I guess it has a serial number or something because they were able to uh, to say it was from Flight 370. That's right. So, and, um, and, and over the years, they had discovered, I think, 14 pieces of debris and two have positively been identified 
as coming from MH Flight 370. However, the aircraft itself has never been found and the crash site has never been located. The search was, I guess the official search was, was, was called off in maybe 2016. But as late as 2018, there was a, a company, an Ameri- a Dutch-based and a, an American company called Ocean Infinity offered to resume the search in January of 2018. They announced that they were planning to resume the search in about a 9,700 square mile area. They would only accept payment if wreckage was found. And I guess they were pretty confident, but despite being out there until March of 2019, nothing was ever found. So that's pretty much the story. This aircraft has never been found. A little bit of positively identified debris has been found. However, uh, I don't know the details of this, but I remember when that wing fragment was found, someone had tracked it down that uh, a wing or a section of the wing, maybe the flaps had been changed on that aircraft at some point, and that it's possible that was actually something that had been discarded in like a junkyard or something. Somebody pulled it up and placed it and planted it you know, like it's a cover up, like, hey, we found it, so the plane must have crashed, kind of thing. Oh, I remember hearing that. Yeah. I've seen those kind of claims. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, is everybody loved the mystery and they got their pet theory of what they think happened. The truth is, is nobody really knows what happened. I mean, most people suspect that the pilot was suicidal himself. The two Iranians that were on there at first, everybody jumped on that. But then, um, you know, it turned out they looked to be just like asylum seekers, right? They just wanted to leave Iran and start a new life somewhere else and had family in Europe and didn't seem to have any kind of ties to any terrorism or anything. And no group took responsibility for it. And generally, if you have a terrorist group that would do something like this, they would say, hey, that was us. You know, so, you know, you imperialist pigs, we, we took out your airplane, you know, or whatever. Yeah, so I, I was looking around and I found this guy, Mr. Richard Godfrey. He's a uh, retired aeronautical engineer who has spent countless hours and written several papers peer-reviewed on the missing flight. Him, coupled with several other uh, researchers, using uh, the information that was provided by the satellite pings and other radar data, as well as the debris field that showed up and currents of the ocean and the timeline there, believe they have pinpointed it to a 40 kilometer square area. And it looks like they're going to be sending another group of salvage experts out to check that area. Hopefully that's going to give us some answers. Now, there is a part of the retrieval system for a downed aircraft that is a, uh, what is it called? It is a pinging device, an underwater locator beacon. beacon. Now, these underwater locator beacons only operate for a certain amount of time before the batteries go bad on those. Mm -hmm. They believe they may have gotten a couple of faint pings at a couple of points during the initial yeah the australian team did Mm -hmm. and they never could yeah they never could uh, narrow it down right so um i guess that coupled with all the other data they have they feel fairly confident that they have a, a pretty good location and uh godfrey's work is pretty impressive and thorough and he does have expertise in the area to a degree that people are taking him quite seriously Now, the MH370 flight path report that Richard Godfrey uh, put together uh, provides the findings every two minutes during the entire flight of MH370 from the 7th of March 2014 to the 8th of March. The analysis used the global detection and tracking of any aircraft anywhere software. And this extrapolates data where data is missing in between the points that are provided by the hard data from the satellite. And the analysis is pretty thorough. And this is what allows him to determine where that plane was. And also that it's very likely that the last 20 minutes it went into a uh, into just like a, a flight circle where it was just rotating in a certain area over the ocean before it crashed. And there is speculation, uh, though, I mean, we can probably never be sure that the captain probably depressurized the cabin, which hopefully, I mean, horrifically as it is, may have given a more peaceful slumber for the people before they actually crashed. 
So if it was the captain, what's been speculated is he probably climbed, and, and this is coming from someone who analyzed the radar data. They were cruising at 35,000 feet, pretty high for an airliner, but they speculate that the pilot climbed to 40,000 feet, which was pretty close to its operational ceiling, but the air is even thinner at 40,000 feet. Then depressurized the cabin. In the cockpit, now he, keep in mind this, either you have a conspiracy and the co-pilot's in on it with you, or he just asked the co-pilot to step out or whatever and um, locked him out. All of those little oxygen masks drop down, right? Whenever there's a depressurization event on an aircraft, which does happen from time to time, those masks will drop down and give you about five minutes of air. But the pilots have these portable units. They typically would have four of them in the cockpit, two for the pilot, two for the co-pilot. But keep in mind, the co-pilot doesn't need his, right? Because he's going down. So he would have his and the co-pilots, which would probably be good for about 20 to 30 minutes worth of air. So climb to 40,000 feet, everyone in the cabin within 10 minutes are gone because they're gonna run out of oxygen, they're gonna pass out, everyone dies. And, and the idea of, of, of course, when the airplane depressurizes, you drop these masks down, you've got about a five minute supply of air, but the pilot should be descending below 10,000 feet so that there's enough air there to breathe. But if, you know, but, but if he didn't drop, then they would have quickly ran out of air and would have been to the demise of everyone. Who knows? And then if he was being suicidal, did he want to just disappear as he did? Makes one wonder why not just go ahead and crash the aircraft right then instead of going for another eight hours or whatever. Did he want it to be a big mystery? You know, who knows? If, if that's indeed what happened. But it seems to be the, the likeliest scenario. Although there are some other theories. You want to get into those? Ian Higgins wrote a book about this known as The Hunt for MH370. He proposes that Captain Zahari parachuted out of the plane to meet his secret lover waiting on a boat and that he actually survived. Of course, no one else did. Higgins was apparently told that the pilot wanted to leave his wife but feared it would be difficult because of his Muslim faith and therefore designed an elaborate plan to escape his marriage. According to the theory, he took fake IDs to assume a new life, depressurize the aircraft to comatose and kill the passengers before jumping out at 3,000 feet and let the plane crash into the sea. So there's one idea. Another popular theory is that uh, the cabin depressurized, but somehow nobody knew, and it was an accident. Captain Zahari may have been on a break at the time with the co-pilot, who was much less experienced at the controls, perhaps became confused because of the lack of oxygen is why the airplane turned, and, uh, and then they all flew out to sea. And then it became a ghost plane because everyone died, but the aircraft's on like autopilot or something, right? Yeah. And then it's just flying out to sea. Like a ghost plane. Everyone's dead. Yeah. Problem with that theory, I think, is the transponder and the ASCAP system being turned off. Yeah. Here's a good one. Remote cyber hijacking. In his book, Beneath Another Sky, historian Norman Davies said technology designed to prevent another 911 style terror attack by allowing planes to be controlled remotely could have been exploited by cyber spooks. He suggests MH370, which was equipped with a Boeing Honeywell uninterruptible autopilot onboard computer, could have been hacked and then reprogrammed and flown to a secret location. Uh, do they speculate as to where that secret location might be? The plan may have been carrying sensitive material or personnel to Beijing. There are reports that the cargo detailed in the manifest didn't add up. I don't know what it might have been carrying, but it may have been carrying something somebody didn't want to get to China. Hmm. The plot thickens. So think about it. Of course, I think that's why he turned the ASCAP system off, because I think that's the system that is used to, if a plane is hijacked, like 911 style, I think they can take control of the aircraft remotely using the autopilot. I think there's fail safes built into modern aircraft like that. Wow. But I think that system that he turned off is how it's done. Well, what about this one? American political commentator Rush Limbaugh 
claims that the plane may have been shot down. So By whom? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Military forces from the past uh, have done this before with various planes. In Nigel Cawthorn's book, Flight MH370, The Mystery, he alleged that after the jet was shot down during a U.S. Thai Joint Strike Fighter training exercise, searchers intentionally were sent astray as part of a sophisticated cover-up. There was apparently uh, some, um, some training exercises going down in the region where the plane disappeared. And there's some speculation that maybe they accidentally shot it down. Now, anybody who knows those training missions, they don't use live ammo when they're in the air. In 2018, a British video producer claimed to have spotted the aircraft's remains in Cambodia using images from Google Maps, which were dated for that year. Ian Wilson claimed to have found the remains deep in the Cambodian jungle, producing images that show what appears to be a plane about 70 meters long. The actual plane is officially measured at 63.7 meters long. Wilson told, Measuring the Google sighting, you're looking at around 69 meters, but there looks to be a gap between the tail and the back of the plane. It's just slightly bigger, but there's a gap that would probably account for that. Wilson said that he planned to visit the jungle in order to prove his theory. And I don't have anything else on that, how that worked for him. Um, some people propose that there's an Asian Bermuda Triangle. You know, I think you had made that comment whenever we did our episode on the Bermuda Triangle that actually the most dangerous place in the world is not the Bermuda Triangle, but the South China Sea. Yeah, that was uh, one of the uh, one of the triangles um, around right. the world. There's one also up uh, off the European coast. Yeah, there was uh, one Malaysian minister... They claim that the area where MH370 vanished is on the exact opposite side of the globe to the Bermuda Triangle. This, of course, is untrue. (laughs) It doesn't quite work out that way. Well, geography was never his strong subject. Right. So, uh, you know what my favorite one is? Do do you know who Don Lemon is? No, I don't think so. So He he is a uh, commentator on CNN. Is or was. I don't know if he's still on there. I don't watch CNN, but um, don't watch any of the major news networks. So Don Lemon says that MH370 may have been consumed by a black hole. Oh. He was criticized by the former U.S. Department of Transportation Inspector General Mary Schiavo, uh, who, while appearing on CNN, said that a small black hole would suck our entire universe. So uh, we know it's not that. Well, I mean, it wouldn't suck in the entire universe, but it'd definitely take out planet Earth. Sucked into a black hole, but then it didn't. The black hole didn't suck anything else out. I guess it. I mean, blinked out of existence. Maybe I don't know how those things work. I'm not an astrophysicist. Not a science fiction writer. Yeah, I'll only read stuff. Um, I mean, since no one's ever observed the black hole on Earth, I don't know about that theory. Yeah. Uh, some people, back on your shot down thing, some people think North Korea may have shot it down because they were doing missiles and things. Uh, but then some people think it was hijacked and landed in North Korea. Never mind that North Korea is nowhere near the trajectory of where this airplane is known to be tracked. Now, here's uh, an Australian man claimed that he had found the wreckage of MH370, another one, using Google Earth. Peter McMahon, a mechanical engineer and amateur crash investigator, spent years combing the Indian Ocean on Google Earth looking for the plane. According to McMahon, the wreckage of the flight, which he claimed was riddled with bullet holes, was located just a few miles south of Round Island in an area of the ocean that has not been searched by crews. He took his claims one step further. He also said that he believed the U.S. officials were refusing to search the area and were withholding information from the public. So, you know, of course, what's a good conspiracy theory without, you know, U.S. government cover-up? Yeah, talk talk about U.S. government cover-up. Conspiracy theorists have suggested that MH370 was either captured by the United States and then flown to the United States military base on the atoll of Diego Garcia in the British Indian Ocean Territory, or that the plane landed at the base directly after being instructed to travel there. Now, this made it all the way up to a White House daily briefing on the 18th of March, whereupon Press Secretary Jay Carney responded, 
Uh, I'll rule that one out. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, we do have a big naval base there. Yeah. Um, let's see. Another theory surrounds the death of a Malaysian diplomat who had spent years investigating the crash. In August of 2017, Zahid Raza, the honorary Malaysian consul in Madagascar, was shot dead in Madagascar's capital in an apparent assassination. Amateur U.S. flight investigator Blaine Gibson, who worked with Raza in tracking down debris from the plane, told that the diplomat appeared to have been specifically targeted and claimed that he has also received death threats. Victor Ionello, an original member of the independent group of specialists that helped the Australian investigators try to pinpoint the plane's crash site in the southern Indian Ocean, said timing of Raza's assassination just days before he was due to deliver several new pieces of debris to the Malaysian Ministry of Transport makes a possible link to MH370 even more suspicious. So, very, very odd. Another speculation is there may have been someone on the plane that had a massive life insurance policy. May as well throw that one in there. I like this one the best, though. That 5% of Americans surveyed believed that the plane was abducted by aliens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because there was a number of UFO sightings in Malaysia. Alexander Bruce from proves the involvement of aliens. Her analysis of the radar data, she claims the footage posted shows the presence of something that can only be termed a UFO in the skies of over Malaysia. Uh, uh, Malaysia's former prime minister wrote that he believes the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency must know something about the plane's fate. He also claimed that Boeing, the plane's maker, and certain unnamed government agencies are able to take control of commercial airliners, such as the missing Boeing 777, remotely if necessary. Airplanes don't just disappear. Certainly not these days with all the powerful communication systems, radio and satellite tracking, and filmless cameras, which operate almost indefinitely and possess huge storage capabilities. For some reason, the media will not print anything that involves Boeing or the CIA. Hmm. And then there's the 20 employees of Freescale Semiconductor that were aboard the plane. They suggest that that company had built components for the NSA to help develop surveillance technology, and that this was revealed in Edward Snowden's documents that he released. And he says, we have an American IBM technical storage executive for Malaysia, a man working in mass storage aggregation for the company implicated by the Snowden papers for providing their services to assist the National Security Agency in surveilling the Chinese. And uh, now this bunch of U.S. chip guys working for a global leader in embedded processing solutions all together on one plane, and it disappeared. Coincidence? Mmm. Suspicious. And finally, this aircraft disappeared exactly 804 days after Egypt Air MS-804 vanished over the Mediterranean on May 19th, 2016. So it was Egyptian Air 804, and it disappeared exactly 804 days after this Egyptian plane disappeared. If you multiply that by four, divide by seven, right? take the well, square root of it, and then correspond that to position of the Great Pyramids. It's synchronicities. That's what a lot of people call it. Synchronicities. These things. That's what Sting would call it. Connected. Yeah. There's links. Definitely. Sting, Stuart Copeland, and and Andy Summers would call it synchronicity. (laughs) Well, all right. Well, all I can say is that is still a huge mystery, despite some of these conspiracy theories that we went over. And, uh, you know, who knows? The most likely explanation is the pilot the one that was most qualified. But um, the truth is, is only those people aboard that aircraft truly know what happened. And we may never know. I mean, even if we find the black boxes in that aircraft, if the wreckage is ever discovered, who knows if they'll be in any kind of condition after all these years. I mean, it's been under the ocean 
submerged in salt water. I mean, they're they're built to take a licking. There's no doubt about it, and to be submerged in water. But it's been eight years. But maybe they can find that flight recorder and get some additional information about what went down. Right. Well, hopefully, some of this new information that's come out will reinvigorate a search that will will bring about the location of the flight and the retrieval of the flight recorder and maybe we'll get some some answers in the in 2023 if so we'll follow up and uh, let you guys know that's right that's right well jimmy do you have anything else you need to add to mh flight 370 no i don't think so i think we covered uh covered at least what's known up to this point along with uh, all the unknown stuff the conspiracy theories that were propagated by people who have too much time on their hands (laughs) <laughs> maybe I still like the black hole the black hole why not why not yep alright well with all that out of the way this is Stephen Hawk signing out and we'll see you next week and Jimmy Coe keep your eyes to the skies and your feet on the ground we'll catch you next week and uh you know where we're going this weekend right Stephen right well as listeners are listening to this we may be at home because we're going to try and release this on Sunday, the day we are at Moth. That's right. We'll be there Friday, Saturday, yeah. and Sunday. Uh, look for us. We'll be in our some of our gear. At least I will. I'll be in a Cosmic yeah. Sponge t-shirt, handing out some cards and um, some stickers, and saying hi to folks. I'll be wearing a Bigfoot shirt or a Roswell UFO shirt. Ooh, Roswell looks good. Yeah. Yeah. We had, you bought it for me. So. Oh, of course I did. <laughs> Yeah. All right, man. Let's get out of here. All right. Sounds good. Catch you later. That's all for this week's episode of Cosmic Sponge. Please don't forget to rate and review us wherever you listen. It helps others find the show. If you have any questions or have a story you'd like to share, you can contact us using our email account at firstcontact at cosmicsponge.com. If you'd like to support the show, consider becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash cosmicsponge where you get access to exclusive content, including our Weird Wonders news and stories released every week. To explore everything Cosmic Sponge has to offer, including other ways to support the show, head on over to our website at www.cosmicsponge.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.